but I th- but I think to say that you're surprised is is think you're expecting people to vote unselfishly when people don't do that. As a whole, I think we're seeing America for what its true colors are. I think there is this false or this fallacy that America has always been this land of the equal and since 2016, we've seen numerous political scandals, racial tensions flaring once more, and the onset of a global pandemic. With last week's Democratic win of the 2020 presidential election, many are seeing that as the answer to today's problems, but it's not quite that simple. On this week's episode of the Infusion Breakdown Show, the Breakdown Crew sat down amongst ourselves to discuss what it's going to take for us to change the political landscape within the next four years. Let's see what we came up with. Before we get started on today's episode, I'd like to introduce to you our Black-Owned Business of the Week, where we showcase quality Black-Owned businesses for you to support every week. This week's business is the Peace Mindset Gratitude Journaling Project, brought to you by previous guest and friend of the channel, Dondre George. Gratitude journaling is an effective practice for keeping oneself grounded and developing a deeper appreciation for things that often go overlooked. If you're looking to get into the practice, be sure to follow Peace Mindset on IG for some ideas to help get you started. So the question we have for today, what will it take for the political landscape to improve between now and 2024? Comment below, let us know. I think... I think I want to take inventory and kind of have a a discussion with you guys about how exactly we feel or exactly how exactly we feel about the things that have been going on since 2016 to 2020. So as a general observation, it seems that people are becoming more and more radicalized as a whole. And it doesn't seem like there's been a lot done to improve our people as a like as a country and move us forward in uh in terms of where we stand on the world's cake like i have clients in the uk for example and then when they talk about political issues or they ask us things about that and it's always jokes like we are quite literally becoming a laughing stock and that's the way we're perceived by other nations and i think that's something that's unprecedented before and i think that's directly well i know for a fact that's directly correlated with current leadership and there's, a, there's been a number of events that have contributed to that. And I wanted to ask, like, what are your thoughts on the general state of things as they currently are? To say it's unprecedented, I think is, I think it's a uh, overstatement in a sense, just because I think because there's more modern times, because there's more information and just because there's literally a camera in everybody's hand now, I think we're able to consume more of the content, but I think it's more or less just a a case of history repeating itself. And I say that just because what we're seeing isn't brand new. I think it's a diluted version of what we faced around the civil rights movement. And I say diluted just because there really hasn't been an end all be all just yet. There's not like really a clear goal with where protesting is going like yeah okay it's defund the police well what do you do after you defund the police there's not a clear goal as far as we're talking about um just black disenfranchisement okay what's the goal to to um to reach economic inequality for all races and genders regardless of you know where you originate from or what you decide to identify ultimately identify as what once you become of age you know so i i don't think it's necessarily a um i don't think it's unprecedented times i think just as a whole i think we're seeing america for what its true colors are i think there is this false or this fallacy that america has always been this land of the equal and it's a bunch of bullshit at the end of the day i think these race issues have always been america's underlining problem and I think we just see it in wavelengths there might be a period in time to where Michael Jordan is the best basketball player my my white son really enjoys him I become more accepting and then there's times where you have well I really love Donald Trump I love everything he stands for you know I'm, I'm leaning more towards that radical ideology I think it just comes in in wavelengths I don't think it's unprecedented at all actually so you don't think that anything that's going on is unprecedented what i was thinking when i and i say that because even if we were to talk about how 
um, on the West Coast, people are locked up in cages right now. You know, the Mexicans, they're not able to identify the children to the parents. Like, that's the same thing as the Japanese internment camps in the, in the 40s. Like, what we're seeing, everything that is happening right now has had a blueprint. It's just been magnetized and elevated because there's so many more reporters now. There's a camera in everybody's hand. Everybody can have their own perception instead of the one or two that might come from the daily press or you know listening to your to your radio at night waiting for the news to come on like you can literally over consume everything and have multiple theories and assumptions in a matter of seconds where back in the day it might have taken a couple of days or a couple of weeks to formulate those assumptions or those theories based off of when you're able to obtain that news or that knowledge i think the only thing on this unprecedented about it is the age of information like how rapidly you can see George Floyd getting gunned down by the police like before that's probably stuff that took weeks to travel from coast to coast I would have to agree with that to be honest with you I think it's kind of a little bit like what Will Smith said he said racism isn't isn't happen isn't like I forgot what he's what the exact quote was but it's just it's happening it's being filmed it's not happening more is just being filmed now so you're just seeing more of the atrocities that's happening um and like desmond said it, it used to happen I, I would really have to agree with desmond on that one but really i, I didn't really i didn't really know how to really approach this question not your question brian but the actual actual question um because if this question was geared towards what like joe biden should do or something like that and i would say the best thing he can do is do his best to turn the economy around in some way so voters don't have a reason not to vote democrat in 2024 but if this question, but if, if this question was geared towards more what the people uh, should do, then I think the obvious answer is don't get lazy. But I think that's going to be hard because we as people are genetically engineered to become lazy. I feel, and I think we, when it when it comes to we as Americans, it's rooted in our culture because which is our freedom, which is, uh, which is our freedom, uh, the freedom that we have as an American citizen. Although it is. A privilege that also means that we have less less stricter rules in society, and that also means that we don't have that proverbial monkey on our back forcing us to do things society wants us to do. Um, I mean, people for as long as I've been, for as long as I can remember, have been talking about how uh, China and or Japan is ahead of us, ahead of the United States in academics and everything, and that's really because those kids don't have that same freedom to become relaxed and not do good in school and uh, and just put it off to the side and say, come back to it or whatever. Uh, and that's why you see like African college students coming to the country and excelling and mastering and shit like chemistry and everything. Oh. Um, so, so, so yeah, I say that and basically it's because it means more to them, I feel. And I say that to say this, I think people respond better when shit goes to hell. And, we, and what I mean by that is because look what it took for the amount of people to come out and vote this time around. Uh, it took President Trump to get people to come out and vote, and even get people in the uh, get people empowered uh, to go influence more people to vote. I feel, and I mean, the amount of celebrities that actively engage in act, uh, in activities in order to get people to vote was phenomenal. I feel uh, this year anyway, from setting up polling places to getting people registered. Uh, I know Stacey Abrams did a lot in uh, Georgia. You probably hear that a lot too if you turn on the news. Um, reason they're a blue state now. Um, but I must say, I didn't hear about this in 2016 though. Like. I heard, I know, I remember LeBron coming out and endorsing Hillary and everything like that, but I remember him setting up polling places in Cleveland like he's doing in Los Angeles right now, or mm -hmm. even or even other celebrities uh, doing as much. Uh, so it took really the worst possible scenario to happen in order for people to react. So I do think extreme examples are needed in order to kick people out of apathy for a change. Otherwise, they'll just stay in that, um, they'll stay in apathy and just only we don't, it, 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 huh? Ah, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, uh, it'll only uh, become a concern to them when, it, when it's basically needed. I say, uh, but, but to see, but what we're, you were saying. said it again. I said, which will support what you guys were saying? How what we're seeing is very cyclical in nature. Yeah. Yeah, but to continue really off of that, I would say the biggest thing, I guess, to go deeper into that, the biggest thing is stopping voter suppression and continue on, get, really just to continue to get people to vote, because it's not widely talked about, but voter suppression is something that can really impact an election. And if uh, and if any Republicans are watching, voter suppression is not to be confused with voter fraud, because voter suppression stops a person from voting, while voter fraud means a person is voting under another name or a person is somebody else or something like that. Uh, but voter fraud is ridiculous. 
because a person isn't going to cheat and they don't directly get anything from it. A person isn't going to cheat to maybe get someone elected. And that's, and that's why it doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, there's really no direct benefit, I feel. Uh, but voter suppression makes sense because the United States have been doing it, like really what Desmond has been saying, to black and poor people for decades, from Jim Crow to now, uh, just making, people, making it harder for people to vote. Uh, and they'll do things like colon, uh, closing polling places in certain areas and everything like that. Um, but I know I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I've seen plenty of headlines of uh, elderly people voting for the first time or having to travel 50 miles to vote and then make it into like a cute headline. But that shit is voter suppression right there. You shouldn't have to travel 50 miles to vote. No. Um, so really, just to wrap it up, I would say the biggest thing, voter suppression, just stopping that and just getting the m- more people out to vote. I feel that'll do well, but because voter suppression is definitely a tactic Republicans can use or have been using for decades now just to get ahead in uh, in elections. Between both of you guys' answers, there was a lot there. Um, and I don't want to get too much off topic. I tried to jot in as much as I could and potentially have some follow-up conversations on that, particularly regarding like the, uh, the education differential between us and then Asian countries. I thought that was fairly interesting. But you did bring up one point that is really related, many, but one specific one that I wanted to talk about was the apathy that we have been experiencing. So within the last election, I had looked in in the 2016 election, 40% of registered voters didn't vote. And that was, I think, the lowest since the 2000 election. Or... I, think, I think a part of that is the candidates and a part of that is the voters. Absolutely. Supposed- yeah, part of that is the candidates, part of that is the promoter suppression because uh, they'll cl- close polling places. And if you're really not invested in a candidate, you're not going to go out your way to go 50 miles or travel really to vote. Because you're like, I, I mean, I-, I would vote for Hillary, but I mean, I'm not bugging right now because I mean, you know how she is. So the, I, it, a lot of that is candidates, but a lot of that too is voter suppression. The people who just stop in the polling places. But like, like you heard from now, like a whole bunch of polling places was open. I think a lot of the voter turnout had to do with the early voting too the fact that people can vote early a lot of people were voting early too a lot of mm-hmm. democrats anyway um so yeah i think a lot of that is voter suppression there was um another study that i had looked at and it was saying that when more people vote democrats tend to win so when the the percentage of registered voters and people who actually go out there and exercise their right to do so and i think that got me along the trail of thinking of how did Donald Trump get elected as president in the first place? So that was one th- factor that I identified was the vote of apathy. They got apathy. They be- they became <laughs> they became uh, relaxed with Obama, and then they let up Trump yep. in office. And then the second uh, factor that I got was Bernie Sanders. So post nomination, a lot of people were upset that Bernie Sanders wasn't their candidate. So there were there weren't many alternatives for that person who, who was in support with that line of things. So it was either okay, well you succeed and you vote for Hillary or you find another candidate that's of a different party, but, or you don't vote. That's what a lot of people actually chose. And in states like Wisconsin, this is a a prime example. I feel like this makes it fairly evident. That's what was going on is the fact that Bernie Sanders won the primary there in 2016 to become the democratic candidate. But Hillary was ultimately the one who was on the presidential ballot. So he, he won the primary there, but lost the overall election to become the candidate. And then in that state, Trump actually won. And it was by a very narrow margin. It was like 47 to 46% or something like that. So I think that had another uh, another factor that was responsible with how he uh, got elected in the first place. So you have like the apathy, then you have the fact that Bernie Sanders was the desired candidate by a lot of people and they didn't really have an alternative. And they didn't really have faith in Hillary Clinton as a, as a candidate, so they didn't vote for her. And then there were other people from another camp. So this is right around the time we were in while I was finishing up at ODU. And Josh, I think you had already finished school. But I do remember having several conversations with people on campus, and they were saying that he would present a unique business perspective. And I thought that idea was absurd. Like, of, of course, business, the economy is part of government. It's that they're, they're intertwined. They're almost inseparable. But the analogy that I used was, so the human body is ran by electricity, essentially. So we have nerve endings that transmit the signals throughout the bo- throughout our body all across the synapses. But would you want an electrician to perform your brain surgery? 
And absolutely not. I mean, I didn't think that he was qualified whatsoever. And I think that just because you have one component that you're known for or um, something that people attribute to you being successful in that domain, that you should be held to the standard of being the most powerful individual in the, in the free world, really, at the highest elected position. I thought that was just ridiculous in itself. And then you see, like, how how policy has been shaped in the uh, in the years leading after that like we're being ran essentially just like a business and that's a, that's exactly like it's not a surprise at least not to me at least and then there were people who were thinking along the lines of the enemy of my enemy so they didn't like what the democrats represented I'm, in the I'm, modern so, I'm, form. So, I'm sorry to interrupt you but some people would say america is a business would you agree with that it's part of it Okay. Keep on. I'm sorry. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? No, I don't know. I was just asking. I would I would really like to take some more time to, to think about that. Okay. But I think you're on something with that. But what do you think that's? America business? No, no, I agree. Like if you if you look at what um, a lot of Republicans were saying about Trump. It was. It wasn't. Look at what magnificent things he's done for society and itself. Right. It's them thinking about. Look at how my 401k has jumped up a certain percentage. Look at how my RA has benefited. Like they're talking about the economy itself. It's never, you know, the the righteousness or things that are centered around morality. It's always money, social I mean, change, political reform. Yeah. None of that. I mean, you got to think about it, man. Like when, first and foremost, president is not, I, I don't think president is ever going to be indirectly involved since I think Lyndon, Lyndon Baines Johnson, or maybe Reagan, when it comes to social issues, like I don't, you'll never see a president, I think, lead a Black Lives Matter, anything or vice versa, vice versa. But I will say when you always think about the president, you think about what they've done for the masses and the masses typically always revolves around money in some way shape or form for obama it was obamacare cutting the cost of health care putting more money in people's pockets that way for trump it has been quote unquote bringing jobs back cutting taxes when it comes to capital gains so your people that know about money already are able to get substantially more money because you've sliced the the percentage to the tax percentage for capital gains and essentially if you don't know what capital gains are that's your return so if you were to have a 401k your return from a from original investment would be your capital gain if you trade forex it's whatever you make from your initial investment that's what capital gains are so if you have to think if i have a hundred dollars and i turn that hundred dollars into into 15 1500 and capital gains tax is only 80 percent then you're making hell of a lot more money than you're going in and clocking in 80 hours a week and getting taxed at, you know, 70% or, or, or 70, I'm sorry, not 80%, 20%. So you get 80% <laughs> of your money and then vice versa. If you go clock in, then you're getting taxed at like 70% or 30%. So you only get to keep 70% of your money, things of, things of that nature. And whereas Trump is directly affecting that. So people are looking like, well, look how much money I'm able to bring in. It's never look how look how you poor we are look how everybody's just bonding together it's well you know what we are in a little bit of chaos right now but damn that that extra five thousand or so i get to my 401k a year kind of kind of balances everything out so i think it is more or less a business is what he can do for the economy itself not what he can do for america itself well i think the economy is really the easiest way to affect people because you see the direct products of that in your life immediately like we all rely on money yeah to an extent but like like i'll say uh because I, I don't think i've actually answered the question the question yet i would say to expect change within the first four years by 2024 or um to have any substantial improvement i think would be to have too high of an expectation or it would be to have an expectation at all when it comes to Joe Biden, I don't really have an expectation. I think what a lot of people are not understanding when it comes to voting Democrat is when you vote Democrat, you're essentially voting for people's rights. 
So one thing I say with this is every time I've got had this discussion where people are like, oh, since you're a political science major, why do you continue to vote knowing so much that you do? One thing that I know that a lot of people continuously overlook is when I indirect, when I vote for a president, I'm indirectly voting for a Supreme Court justice. The Supreme Court justice is who's going to essentially protect trans rights, women's rights, human rights, and any of this other stuff. And think about when Trump presents the Muslim travel ban. It goes to the Supreme Court for them to either withhold it or deny it, say it's unconstitutional. So when you can pack a Supreme Court with Republican judges or conservative judges, that's just as deadly as having a Senate that is a Republican majority, except that Supreme Court majority is lifelong. So you have to think that as your justices get older and years, and we've seen how Trump has attacked transgender rights, we will also see Roe v. Wade, which is women's abortion rights and just women's rights in general now come under now come under scrutiny when it comes to the court. So when I think of a president and I think of politics, I'm thinking of what is essentially the most powerful branch because everything has a flow through the judicial branch, no matter what it is. Everything goes, Obamacare went to the judicial branch. Everything has to go to the to the bench at some form before it become or in some form or no matter what to essentially become land of the law law of the land <laughs> i know what you meant but, but that's that's essentially what i think so when i when it comes to joe biden joe biden has high expectations i feel for all the wrong things he's essentially coming into what obama came into when obama came in we had entered the great recession Biden is coming in at the at the cups of another uh, recession, but it's not per to any particular individual's fault. I think it's people. I think it's a collective fault. People not acting in the right the right ways at the right time to essentially handle COVID better. It could be from the medical professionals all the way up to Donald Trump, but it's not one particular person's fault. So essentially. All he has to do is the same thing that, that Obama did. Take care of COVID-19 and you essentially have your, your re-election because the economy but, is going to rebound. But, but, if, you just, gonna... but if you just said, you, are you saying take care of COVID-19 as in, because you just said, you basically just said you can't directly do anything about COVID. It's, it's us, it's on us. So how, right? Is, is no, I didn't up? say he couldn't do anything directly related to COVID. I said, to have an expectation of Joe Biden for anything to change drastically in the political landscape is too much. So for like Joe Biden to be this this uh, this this uh, godlike figure to bring the people together to improve race relations, do all that like that's that's too high of expectation. Like I think just from a political standpoint, what Joe Biden could do to best set himself up for eight years would be to get COVID under control because the economy is naturally going to reba rebound, which is every Republican's argument, once COVID is under control. But how can he get COVID un under control himself? What is he going to do? Well, I think the first pass thing more is laws, this, or is it, or is it, just, or is it more on us to put our mask on and do more social distancing, like well, we did in the summertime? The they go together. So he's a asking for a, essentially a universal mandate. We don't have a universal mandate right now. Like it's a requirement, it's government order, but there's no true penalty behind it. People can still walk into Target, Food Lion, or whatever without their mask and face no no consequence. Well, so you well, still have okay. the okay, no, so I'm you sorry. still have the ability to do whatever you want to do. You can go to the gym right now. You have your mask to get in, but as soon as you get inside the gym, you can take it off. You go it's eat. It's the same thing. So I think I think essentially when you get that under control, I don't think people are essentially realizing that 30 days of sticking to one thing can affect what happens the six months following that. So we never truly had, like, you could say, okay, people were required to quarantine at home and things like that, but people were still allowed to go out and do whatever they want. They were still, con they were, there was still some form of congregation that was allowing this virus to spread. And we just seen as you kind of roll those restrictions back, it just, it, it, it grows substantially. So I think the first thing he would need to do is get COVID under control if you want to pass if you want if you want the vaccines to, to pass and do whatever they're FDA approved anybody could take it by all means do that but what I'm saying is the second that he implements something 
that best benefits America and the sense of the people first to get COVID under control. That's going to be what the first part of his legacy is about, because that's essentially what Obama's first legacy is about, how he how he. Um, no, I, I agree that if he does get COVID under control, he's definitely in the right um, the right boat. Uh, but I just don't understand how he is in control of that. I think it's more about us. Well, if you think about it, like they just announced that he has a COVID-19 task force that is already assembled. So in terms of about bringing individuals together who can shape policy and make sure that we allocate funds to do the correct research and get this under control. So it's not so much as Joe Biden getting up and say, hey, everyone wash your hands, wear a mask or something like that, and then getting under control because that's, that's, that's not reasonable. But, and then what Desmond was saying, like with the, the mask wearing, that's discretionary for the most part because there are places to where you really can't get in there like they have security there that won't let you in there but for the most part they are like they'll say you can't enter with a mask but if you walk in there no one's really going to approach you so it's very uh law of the land type of thing where each locale you go to is up to them it's not like a universal standard so even if you get in the, under control in one area it all it takes is for one person to take it somewhere else so it's that's why it's a really hard problem to tackle because there's no universal standard and i think that's what you were alluding to that they're trying to establish right essentially and yeah. One reoccurring theme while we're talking about this is, okay, Joe Biden won the election, he's projected as the next president. Why is it all on Joe Biden's shoulders? Like we're looking at it from the perspective of him making the change. Cause like, that's what you're saying. That is unreasonable for one person just because he's elected to change that, um, to change everything and make it better. Like he's not gonna be a panacea to reverse all the, the bad things that have ever happened in this country. That's just not gonna happen. So, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of change that starts everywhere. Like you think about like smaller places, like where I'm from, the the town, Donald Trump won that. And so I was thinking, like, what will it ch- take to change the political landscape in the sense of we have people who like this was a close election, much closer than I would have liked for it to have been. Like if you really think about it, are you surprised? Am I surprised? Mm-hmm. To a degree. Why? Because because yeah, you can say no, but. No, I'm saying why. Yeah, Desmond saying no. I, I'll, I'll say yes because oh, I didn't see that. People, they'll say that they did, at first you can kind of pardon them with the ignorance of saying, okay, he has a business perspective. He's going to come in here and do this, this, that, and kind of change things. It's going to be a different approach. You can kind of pardon them and say that okay, they didn't know, but now after you've seen what has happened after four years, and you want more of it, that part is is shocking to me. It's like. Uh, you like like it's like an abusive relationship like you like getting your ass whooped what 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 has happened exactly i've been in coronavirus what what has happened yeah racial tensions they're they're more in your face like like you said like you said that people people don't blame him for that i'm not i'm talking about his supporters anyway yeah yeah but i i do think that as his supporters not not democrats yeah correct um if even if you want to say that he didn't directly say these things himself, but I feel like sins of, I spoke on this before, sins of omission are as bad as sins of commission. So by you not doing certain things, like I was looking back through the, how he handled certain events like the Unite to Right rally, and then also the, the subsequent events after uh, George Floyd's death and just consistently, there were opportunities for him to outrightly condemn the people who were perpetrating these things and by you not doing that or by you just breezing past and, and skipping over the issue so like with the the comment of saying that there were very fine people on both sides so you're saying that on the side of white supremacy there were fine people and i think those things are mutually exclusive like you can't really have white supremacy and then uh, moral uprightness on the same side um i mean it's that's something that hasn't happened in my lifetime in terms of the things that I'm seeing now. And like, you can kind of attribute that to the fact the that it's being filmed and then you the can- racial tension. Yeah. But I, th- but I think to say that your surprise is, is think you're expecting people to vote unselfishly when people don't do that. Cause what Des, what Des really said, like voting Democrat is voting for other people's human rights, basically. Um, so- I don't like that either. What do you mean? I don't like the fact that one party can be attributed to people's human rights shouldn't they be a concern for every party and like to assume that by default i think we're doing ourselves a disservice yeah it should no be. that's not an assumption though maybe it maybe it should be but that's not how things work 
like I, I remember remember when I said that it's the to vote Democrat is essentially vote for human rights mm-hmm. because we've seen how Trump has implemented the travel ban. We've seen how the the Mexicans who come across the border illegally essentially lose contact with the direct relatives. You don't you're not able to match parents to to their to their children like things right. of that nature like what you would deem as basic human rights are not the first thing to come to mind when it involves republicans like republicans exactly. are known as being um for less government intervention when it comes to uh social social um social dilemmas mm-hmm. so that's kind of why you see racial tension but you don't see any direct government involvement until it comes to Trump calling the National Guard. That's my like, issue. But that's just how their that's just how their philosophy is. Like they're for less government by any means necessary. So they're for less government when it comes to not just money and taxes, but it's the same way when it comes to social dilemma. Like you could argue, yeah, like putting a travel ban is government intervention, but it's government intervention on behalf of Republicans not wanting those people to be in the country to begin with. And I, I, th- and I think a part of it is being moral costs more money. And the other thing the Republican Party is about, they're about their money. So they're not gonna, they're gonna do as as much as possible to spend less as mo- less money as possible. So, and that usually means throwing away, throwing your morals to the side in order to achieve certain goals. So I think that's part of it too. Also, I believe Josh, you asked what was I, or was I surprised at the fact that this election was a lot closer than I would have liked for it to have been or for most of us had liked to have been. And mm-hmm. I would, another thing that contributes to that is the fact that we had such a voter turnout. Like it was, it was a really publicized thing you had. Like you said, a lot of these celebrities going and opening up places to get people registered, going out doing it themselves and speaking on that. And so, like you said, that's something that wasn't present back in the 2016 election even. So you would think with more people that it would have been, I thought the numbers would have been a little bit different. I'm not saying I, it would have been a landslide or anything like that. I wasn't projecting that. I got you. No, I, I, I don't think so. I just think more people vote, more people. There's, there's, there's still people out there who do, who didn't vote, who were undecided and didn't vote at all. Mm-hmm. Like, didn't vote for Trump or Hillary. And then this time they, vote, they ended up voting for... Um, Biden. I'm, yeah, I'm, <laughs> it was a man name. Yeah, they ended up voting for Biden. So, it, I just I just feel that the more people that vote, yeah, all, both sides are going to go up. But I think what Desmond said that, oh no, what you said is um, more people vote, then more likely Democrat will win. But there's still people, the people that don't vote, there's still some Trump supporters who don't vote or like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, like it's not only Democrat that's affected. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, when it comes to demographics, it's not a one size fit all that you can say that oh, all people from this group did this one thing. Yeah, so I'm not surprised that with more people, like it was close, like because people, even even after the racial tension, like if you're a white person and you're looking at the racial tension at a uh, from a certain angle, you're like uh, that still doesn't matter to me. What Trump is talking about matters to me, so that's that's why they vote for him. They don't vote because like what Desmond said again, what voted for Democrat, you vote, you're basically voting for human rights. And people vote selfishly. They don't vote unselfishly, I feel. Anything you want to add, Des? No, I mean, that's essentially, uh, you know, regurgitating what, what we've already said. You know, I, why, why I think that... Smart? Why are you not why am I? Yeah. About how many people voted for Trump? No, about the election. About, I guess, how close it was, I guess. I guess that too. It's essentially what he said. Like our numbers are so high for COVID because we do the most testing out of any country. Like if you, are you generally, genuinely surprised that people who marched out in tiki torches and people that have been those closet races aren't going to come out and continue to support their guy? Like the same way we were advocating for, like those people consume the same media we do. You see the athletes going for a vote just make sure you vote make sure you vote but they're indirectly saying make sure you vote for biden like you know these people these athletes that are coming out that are not vividly stating make america great again like your kobe covingtons your jorge masvidal's your tito ortiz's like all your mma fighters or even some of your athletes 
whether it be baseball or or football or whatever whatever it may be like we essentially know that when lebron james comes out and say or patrick mahomes comes out and say hey make sure you vote they're essentially alluding to democratic party democratic candidates people that they have previously endorsed so those same people that are watching that same media consuming the same instagram content or espn content or whatever it may be or cnn fox news vice versa they see that they're not republican party just doesn't sit idle they always respond and they always respond by action rather than by voice democrats are known to respond by by voice than by action which is what we've seen in 2016. those same people that were out protesting they weren't they not all of them were at the at the at the poll back in 2016 but if you look at now those same people that are protesting now they're finally starting to get that voice and action needs to go together so essentially leading to the grand scheme of everything what how i essentially wanted to answer this question like what will it take for the political landscape to change i don't think the political landscape changes until the socioeconomic landscape changes like until things are taught in school first and foremost there's this misconception of what socialism is until people learn what they fear there's always going to be your presidents your governors your senators saying we denounce socialism without truly knowing what it is when people think socialism they immediately think of communism and they're two completely separate things it's a it's a it's a facet like they share two separate things but communism and socialism are two separate identities in itself they're not they're not one one you know well-rounded theory they're two separate so until people truly learn what those things are whether it be government you know 11th or 12th grade government or unless they start incorporating that stuff in u.s history when it comes to capitalism versus socialism like you 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 genuinely need to start knowing or capitalism versus communism sorry you genuinely need to start knowing what it is that's on the other side of the ring in that red corner you essentially just saying here's what capitalism is this is why it's great people are just going to take that but when you go to higher learning and you understand okay this is what socialism was supposed to be but once socialism is implemented, that one dictator in charge typically fucks it up for the for the majority ma- of the masses because they get all of this wealth because it's, not, it's nothing more than an accumulation of wealth. Then you get the corrupt dictators that you have in your democratic Repub- your, or your DRCs or whatever or what is whatever it is for. Uh, I know Democratic Republic of the Congo, but I think it's the. I'm not even gonna lie to you about North Korea. I, I forgot what they're. Um, I think it's DRK, but when you get that, then that's when they like, oh, okay, I see. Like, I want to avoid whatever happens to Kim Jong and Kim Jong Un regime by, by any means necessary. Instead of understanding like truly what it is, because what goes on in Kim Jong Un's regime or what's going on in, in communist uh, and uh, what it, what first word, Cuba, like it's two completely different things than what socialism truly is. So until you actually educate people on what these ideologies are, you're not going to have a well-educated political landscape. You're going to have your people on the right that could say, well, we denounce socialism, you know, free health care for all, free free higher learning, like that's that's socialism. Like people are going to take that and run with it. They're, they're just going to think back to the past because it's that history always repeats itself ideology that keeps people in check. And keeps people in, in other people's pockets and it keeps those votes in their pockets as well whereas if you have a, a a group that's not only educated in politics but money how how financial uh literacy works and things of that nature like you're going to have the same redundancy every year you're going to have republicans clinging on to what they believe as the good old days and then you're going to have the democrats trying to break down the door say hey we want our rights we want our seat at the table without tr- without not truly knowing what that seat at the table entails and i do see what you're saying I, I do agree about educating ourselves about the the differences between those various systems like people often conflate the differences with what conflate marxism communism socialism even though that they're related it's kind of like a venn diagram there's overlap yeah. but they aren't exactly synonymous but i think what you're getting at and i'm i'm not we we spoke about capitalism on previous episodes and social policy and things like that briefly and so i do think 
I do have confidence in, in, in capitalism being the most stable economic system that we've that we've experienced. But I do think that you can have social policy inside of that without being really socialist. And I mean, my problem with socialism, for example, is the fact that it's done for the wrong reasons. And I think if you look across the examples of history, like you're saying, like it's not, it's fairly evident that that's what exactly what happened. And then you end up in those situations where you have your dictators. Yeah. But I mean, I think the greatest example is Great Britain right now. Like I, I'm not too sure if Great Britain uh, does free higher higher education, but they, I, if I'm not mistaken, they do uh, have like a centralized healthcare system. So you're not breaking your back to get your prescriptions or for a woman to go see a gynecologist. Like it, it's not these outrageous costs like it is in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So for them to be essentially the powerhouse in the East next to, to Russia, to be so small, but to be to have such a loud voice, like they've they have a blueprint that the U.S. could follow if they just paid attention. It's kind of like why you say you know your your clients from the uk they say this about the united states that we're the laughing stock right now it's because they actually invested in their people whereas we're investing in the businesses to continue to provide for the people like you you're putting your emphasis on your apples your googles your microsoft those those billionaires that run these companies which are amazon but you're not putting the emphasis on the people yeah so you said that I just wanted to recap to make sure that we that, I, that I've taken everything in properly. So you were saying that you don't essentially think that in the next four years that anything substantial is going to change. So what's what's stopping somebody, someone else who is like Donald Trump, for example, running for office again and using the same rhetoric? Because what what he proved and what I was saying about this race being so close is that there is a market for it. People will eat that up and it's, it shows you like if you look at the numbers across the states and then like uh down to the specific counties and in, in the uh locales that voted for him so and you said did you say nothing was stopping that yeah nothing's going to stop another donald trump for coming and what you have to realize is this 2024 could essentially be the same thing as the 2020 race it's think about how many people voted for donald trump like you keep saying that number is so astronomical yeah 2024 because donald trump could essentially run again in 2024 every president is due i'm expecting that years. so he could essentially run in 2024 and you might say it see the same thing people that voted biden were like well damn like my money really isn't where it used to be and then they flip back to trump like they sent here and say like we're still dealing with the social issues and now my pockets are, are a little bit lighter they could easily flip back to trump and what happens is you also have the people that the people that are on trump's side coming back and voting in 2024 should him or anyone that is in the same ballpark as him run and then you see that 70 million mark jump up to 75 or 80. like it could be the same exact thing that we saw this election where a lot of democrats did not vote in 2016 and then they came out full and full fledged, full fledged force in 2020. So that there is a there is a possibility for that to happen, which is why I'm not particularly surprised or impressed with Biden win. One because Biden is, I don't think, for the younger generation, they're they're number one. But for number two, mm-hmm. like if he he makes one bad move, he's out of there. Like you, like there's those numbers are so astronomical to me to where 70 million people came out and voted for both parties the biggest election turnout in the history of the united states for me to just sit here and think like oh yeah we're definitely about to be where we need to be we're, we're about to you know be this integrated you know fully together country again like that's just asinine like it shows you it's literally split down the middle 50 50 the only thing that might be saving democrats is the electoral college the same way people claim it hurt them in 2016 like the electoral college without a doubt say the democrats is go around like if 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 stacy abrams could not have turned georgia blue and if pennsylvania the pennsylvania turned blue as well then they're not yeah if pennsylvania so. would have tur- stayed red like trump was on his way to beat biden 270 to 264. like if those last if nevada would have stayed with trump because nevada was really close as well 
if any of those battleground states that were not supposed to be battleground states flipped red, it would have been a Donald Trump victory. Like, it wasn't like he smacked them out of the park. Like, it was a really close race. So I, I expect that divisiveness to carry on over the next four years because people were used to what Trump was bringing to the table. Right. And what I was saying about even it wasn't if it's like, not him, like someone else could come, come along better and be more eloquently spoken. They could be more manipulative and, and smarter about how they handle their business or conduct themselves. Like they're not on Twitter broadcasting every single move that they're right. doing. That sounds and so, like a regular and, and you have to Republican. Think, like people were more scared of Mike Pence than they were Donald Trump. People feared Mike Pence more than they feared Donald Trump. And what, what people have to realize, this wasn't a passing of the guard. This wasn't 2008 to where Bush ended his two terms and it was Romney versus Obama. Like this is a guy that people, 70 million people truly feel for and feel with. Like that that's not just gonna go under that's not gonna be swept under the rug and I, I'm, I'm not mistaken i don't think i don't think democrats control the uh the senate, senate. right now either i think it's really close I think but so. i don't think they control it and so whatever biden wants to push right now it, it's like it's gonna be hard when it comes to the political landscape i, I don't think we should talk about joe biden because i i believe i did read something that he's only spending four years as president, which means he's going to give the duties over to Kamala Harris um, and have her run in 2024. I believe that's what's going to happen. Uh, Kamala Harris won't the first one either, though. Like, the thing is, he would be doing himself a disservice by doing that because... I, I just, I just Kamala, said it's a good move. I was just like... Yeah, yeah. Well, you're saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't bring it up and then you bring up Kamala Harris. I'm like, that's not a smart move either. Like, people they didn't want Kamala Harris just as much as they didn't want Joe Biden. Like the, the convent, the committee or democratic national convention or committee, like they selected them people. Like people still came out and voted for Biden and full fledged, but like, we'll see. And, and to Brian's uh, question, like what would stop another Trump or even Trump himself? I think the biggest thing is the Republican party. Like, I think they have to, decide is this the direction we're going to go to do we want to go to trump because they're so back and forth with it they don't even really know so they have, they have to either go all in on trump or go back to what they was already doing which was the in the closet racism not everybody of course uh but in just the regular republican way back in uh 2004 george w bush type republican way uh, so I think it's really up to them. And if they don't have an idea what they want to do, if they think Trump can get them another win, because that's really all they're worried about is just another win. So if they feel they can right. get another win from Trump, they're just going to go follow him. But it really depends on who's the candidates at that point. I mean, who's going to be the candidates in 2024? It'd probably be Donald, Donald Trump. You haven't really heard of anybody, any other Republican person that's like, rising through the ranks. Well, he's, who's going to be Donald Jr.? Like, who, who's, who's going to run for... So like they, you can't you can't even name all those people though because the same way Donald Trump shouldn't have been there in 2016. But he wasn't a politician billion. though. You you can't really blame exactly. anybody for not. Okay, I get okay. I told yeah, what I'm saying another okay. billionaire yeah. could easily come up out of the woodwork and have that same impact. Oh yeah, I got you. Yes, yeah, possible. This is all hypothetical, but what are your thoughts on a possible amendment to the Constitution to require experience in public service to it to some degree? Yeah, that one, that one no, to, no, I'm not. I'm not asking whether it passed. I'm like, what are your thoughts on it? To be president? Yeah. Like essentially, they would have to had experience as a senator or a governor. Um, I mean, but it's also experienced people. Like you can look at how they they ran a a, a state and apply it to the country. Like there's no guesswork involved in it, and I think. I, I feel more confident in that. It's like with anything else, you if you have experience, it's taken into consideration. But to to your point, um, I know you're about to say something else about that. But afterwards, I want you to kind of explain why do you say that that would not uh, fly or wouldn't pass? Because there's already so many limitations on what you can on to being becoming president anyway. Like you have to be. There are a lot of. I'll say it this way. There are a lot of um, mayors, senators that are not born in the United States that are doing far better than some of the born and bred residents that have ran that state. 
So for me to say like, oh, well, you know, the president has to have like, you know, certain experience, like it's to fraternize it's to say, hey, we only want to choose from our cream of the crop, even though that cream of the crop might not be the best. Like it is a fraternity at the end of the day, don't get me wrong. Like to say you were the president of the United States, like it's substantial, but essentially why I ultimately watch that thought is governor, senator, mayor, city council, whatever, they directly reflect the interests of the people that voted them. The president does not. The president's main responsibility is to represent the interests of the United States of America. They, That's a major they, point. They do so much. Like, I, don't get, I would say, like, if the president was truly the end-all, be-all to have a direct hand in what goes on in America day in and day out, then yes, I would be willing to introduce the idea because that's where that experience will ultimately come in and benefit. But to have a senator come in and become president, like even with that experience, you you have very limited international law experience. You have very limited experience when it comes to how to handle a country during times of war. You also have very limited experience on how to handle a time handle a country during time of recession none of those prior positions governor senator city council or mayor prepares you for that moment i mean nothing because prepares that, you for responding to war exactly well nothing prepares you for anything that the president has to directly respond to that's what i'm saying that's why i don't think it's necessarily a requirement like yes you get the experience with you know creating legislation but the president doesn't even create that legislation the president right. has a team creating that legislation for him and it still has to go to senate and at times still go to the supreme court so that experience you're getting you're never really applying it full hand because what you have your hands tied with is things that the governor would never have his hand ties with or a senator or a mayor or, count, or a city council vice versa so that experience you have is more or less like the pre prerequisites to start your to start your actual um your major in college if you get what i'm saying like typically your prerequisites are just to get you into the door when you actually get through the doors when you start learning what you're supposed to learn that ne didn't necessarily tie into what those prerequisites were mm -hmm. so that's what that's how i look at i think like prerequisites were, was the dumbest thing in college because i could i could have went in as a freshman learning about congress but i have to wait till i'm a junior or senior to start learning about congress like it's it's still my money just to learn prerequisites yeah. i got i like i lied to you not my prerequisites for political science are u.s history and uh i think world history things like that things you learned your junior and senior year in high school like exactly it, i guess they just, yeah yeah i remember that yeah Anything like i'm that? not i'm just not a big i'm not a big fan of the prerequisite yeah, I don't, I don't like that either. Why not? Because what he said, like I'm basically paying. Like when I realized I was doing high school work as a freshman in college, like I got upset. Like I don't want to. No, no, no. I'm not talking about college. Oh, what? What do you mean? <laughs> so about the the prerequisite for being elected as president. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I, 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 I understand what he's saying. Um, I agree to the, I agree for the most part, but. I do think you should look at like if a billionaire was trying to go for uh, go run for president. I do think you should look at their history and see how good they are at running said uh, company if they're running a company. Hey, Josh is trying to make. I mean, not Josh. Brian is trying to make the the presidency must have bachelor's degree for equivalent <laughs> of seven years of experience. <laughs> oh my god, that's the first thing I thought of, man. When Josh started talking must have bachelor's degree or seven years of experience in, in said field. Yeah, that's, that's, uh... <laughs> Before we actually wrap up, did, did you, um, did you want to respond to what I said earlier, Brian, about, you said the kids being ahead, or did you still want to think about that more? Um, I think that could be a separate episode altogether. Okay. I think I had a, a topic, a question already posed, so we can discuss that later. Oh, okay, cool. All right, anything else you guys want to add then? No, I mean, this is exactly what I expected for us to have in, ter for, in terms of what we got out of today's episode. Like, 
Desmond with his background, I was looking to take this as a, a educational opportunity to learn a little bit more. Part of it was what Desmond said, like, it's not going to take just four years. No. Nah. It's, it's going to take more than that. And, but, and then I was like, yeah, Joe Biden's not going to be in there. For, he's, I think he's just going to be in there for four years. So I think it's something completely different. And what I was going to actually ask too was, uh, how did Desmond actually feel about the what I said about apathy uh, earlier? Like, do you feel that's true? Like, do, are people usually diagnosed with apathy to the point they just? Yeah, yeah, like that's something you actually like. We go, we went over a lot. Not just I, I'm not sure if it was. Yeah, it was definitely uh, something I learned at ODU. It's like stress, how how big voter apathy plays a part in. In your elections, not just your presidential elections, but your your Senate, governor, like any of your local elections, like voter apathy is a real thing. I would say it's even more of a thing at the the lower levels. Yeah, definitely. I would say that. I think some of that is too is people don't have the the knowledge too. Like people don't really understand that the lower levels probably have a more of an impact than on your everyday than actually. Uh, voting for president so yeah part of that is that's part of it too i think a lot of comes a lot of what you're saying josh actually comes from the visibility of the office too like yeah that too yeah. the governor of virginia for example the average person watching the news or getting updates they're not getting updates and insight into what the governor's doing for the state they're looking at what the president said and what they're doing at these they're flying overseas to meet with the the prime minister of some other country or but they're completely ignorant to what's going on inside of their own state with the person who is most hands-on involved in it. Yeah. I'm like, I think the, the biggest example of that is like your city council, they pick the jurisdictions for your school. Like your city council says which neighborhoods go to which school, what's going to be the cutoff. They, like they do all that stuff. And you only see those people's names when it's time for them to run. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But all right, though. Good discussion, though. Really appreciate it. Uh, you got an album of the week for us, Des? Yeah, I was scrambling a little bit because my phone likes to overheat. But um, I'm going to do Party Pack. It's uh, like a compilation album from Party Next Door of all his um, older songs, like in the early 2010s. Um, give it a listen. You said it's a compilation album? Yeah, yeah, it has like all his older songs. It's like it's not one sound body of work. It's just all his singles that he's released at the start of like the 2010s that might not have made it to an album or not, might not have got the sample cleared when um, you know streaming service services became a thing. Okay, gotcha. All right, make sure you guys check it out. I want to remind everybody that we are now also on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, so please check that out if you guys don't want to look at our faces the whole time. So just throwing that out there. But if you guys like the discussion, don't forget to hit the like button. And we're going to see you guys next week. Peace. But while you're here, be sure to check out other great content from the Breakdown crew, including previous episodes of the podcast, Joshua vs. Movies, Joshua vs. Music, and of course, haven't forgotten about my plant lovers, feel the love. Just check out this begonia. <laughs>